Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. Coming up on the program this week. I sort of learned escapism from my dad and I just like emulated that behavior. And it was a way for me to get out of what was going on with me and like sort of numb myself and try to like be a different person or at least not feel any feelings anymore. That's kind of what I wanted. There will be people who from the outside are making all of those judgments as that process is going on and going, well, she's messing this up because, or why is she acting like this? Or why does he do this? Or he's ruining everything or she's not responding the way that I think that she should respond from this outside perspective as well. I would never judge anybody else based on the way they behaved in the absolute worst time of their lives. Why would you, <laughs> why, why would you do that? And obviously looking back on that now, I've been able to learn that lesson. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. Yeah, welcome to the home of the UK's conversation about mental health. It's Mental Health Monday. Once again, thanks for checking out the programme. Another fascinating guest on the way. A lot of signposting in this week's edition as well to uh, various different things that are going on. And as ever, really class that as a really important part of the podcast to make sure that when we do talk about conversations in various different ways, those conversations are actually uh, going in a direction which allow people to hopefully relate to them, find elements within them that can help maybe support them or uh, shine a light on an issue which otherwise you don't necessarily know about. But at the same time to then find resources that might help you or that you can point other people in the direction of. And we got some really positive feedback last week from our conversation around eating disorders and men. And uh, the BEAT website for that one, BEAT Eating Disorders, a UK charity, really, really great service and resources on there. Not just for men, for anyone who's experiencing uh, anything in regard to eating disorders. There's a helpline that's available from them as well. Last week's edition is available now. Uh, this week's guest on the program uh, has got a really fascinating story to tell and there's so much in there about personal experience we talk about addiction we talk about alcoholism we talk about abusive relationships uh, we also talk about the benefits that come from uh, writing uh, taking an opportunity to put pen to paper and to explore feelings uh, through a million and one different ways and that might be poetry writing letters and countless other things but cc reagan is our guest uh, she's originally from the united states of america uh, from north carolina but now finds herself living in the northeast of england in, in newcastle uh, she's got some really powerful insights into what life is like for people who who live with alcohol addiction but not just as a standalone issue as a one-off that actually when we talk about alcohol addiction or addiction in general, we've also got to look at the person, the circumstances, the situation that they found themselves in when that addiction kicked in. Because of course, there's one thing saying to somebody who's got an addiction, we'll stop doing that then. If we don't tackle the wider issues that they faced in their life or the wider issues that they're facing on a continuous basis, how on earth are we expecting them to be able to move on and to find you know, uh, healthy and happy alternatives? I think this conversation really sums that up, and I hope you're really going to enjoy it. CC Regan is her name. I mentioned the website, which I'll mention now. You can get on board with it a little bit later on as well. Righttoheal.me. That's right as in W-R-I-T-E. Righttoheal.me. Uh, do urge you to find out some more information about CC and the work that she's doing. I wanted to mention as well, a few weeks ago, we had Simon Taylor on the program. Now, Simon, a musician who uses his own mental health experience to uh, inspire the work that he does now from a musical point of view. Uh, he sent me a note through and uh, Simon, it's great to hear you've continued to be part of the, uh, the podcast family. Uh, he's got a new mental health themed EP, uh, which will be released uh, this coming Friday, as we record this, uh, the 4th of February. It's called Survival, and the theme song, the title song, is about his own experiences of mental health problems, but also he hopes acting as a message for people affected by issues to try and stay strong and to go on and thrive. So more than happy to give that a mention. I will also point you in the direction of his um, Bandcamp uh, website, where you can find out more information about both Survival and his other music as well. I'll put a link below the podcast for that one. So thank you for that one. Great to have you part of the Mental Health Monday family. And it's always great when we hear about the great things that our previous guests are doing, the things they're involved in. And now, of course, we as members of the public, the layperson uh, can get involved in that too. Let's get on to our conversation now with Cece Regan, uh, Right to Heal. Dot me is her website. And we started off by talking about her location because, as you will hear, uh, although she's in Newcastle now, that's not originally where she's from. 
Yeah, so I grew up between like North Carolina and Virginia in the States, which is like on the East Coast, and it's a lot warmer than here. And uh, every like January, I question all of my life decisions. <laughs> And you're now here in the UK. You're doing some fantastic work. You're sharing your story as well, which is why you're here on Mental Health Monday today uh, at a time where I think people are maybe for the first time uh, in recent years been more open about their mental health journey and actually seen it as a positive. And obviously you see this as a, from a perspective of being in the United States as well. I just wanted to first and foremost sort of ask how you view this sort of current mental health conversation that we're having in the UK. Are we ahead of other people? Are we, are we behind where we've been at uh, places like the United States? You know, honestly, I think um, in a lot of ways the UK is ahead of the states with a lot of this stuff. I think um, maybe a lot of it comes down to like the NHS and things like that and actually having more access to support um, and like being able to, to get the help because obviously in the states it's like, you know, if you wanna see a therapist then you don't have health insurance and you have to pay a certain amount. If you do have health insurance then you have to pay your copay anyways and <laughs> health insurance and all that stuff. Um, and I think, in general, when it comes to sort of like wellness and safeguarding and those kinds of things, and my experience in a lot of different ways, the UK seems to be ahead of the US, to be perfectly honest. In terms of your journey, where you're at now, the place that you're in versus the place that you are, there's been a huge, huge sort of undertaking in terms of uh, how you've sort of worked on that yourself and the people that you've had around you. Um in terms of your mental health journey, where do you where do you see it starting? Is there a moment in the past where you go, well, this this was the start of of the journey that I'm on currently? I, yeah, I mean, I would say the start was when I decided to get sober. Um, I am six years sober from um, alcohol addiction. Um, I celebrated six years on the first of this year, actually. Uh, and I think that was very much the beginning of things because before then it was all just about like self-medicating. I mean, I had been to therapy before then, um, but I don't think I was really in a place where I wanted to like put in the work or make the changes. So I would say like I had been to therapy, but I wasn't really ready to start my journey until I was like, all right, I want to like get sober and figure out who I am now. And in terms of that, the alcoholism, was that something that was a standalone issue or was that symptomatic of sort of other factors you've had in your life? I know that you've had sort of, uh, there's been a lot going on in your life. Uh, uh, do you see those two separate journeys or one in the same? No, I think it's one in the same. I view addiction as like as a symptom of an underlying issue rather than the issue itself. Uh, and I think that it stemmed from a lot of things. I mean, my dad was an alcoholic and there was a lot of like situational things that were happening uh, in my life around the time that I started drinking. So I started drinking when I was like 14. My mom had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. My uncle had passed away very suddenly. Um, my uh, dad had a um, suicide attempt, which was unsuccessful. Uh, but obviously that was really difficult. And then plus, you know, you're 14 <laughs> and life sucks when you're 14 <laughs> anyways. So it was a bunch of stuff going on all at once. And uh, I sort of uh, learned escapism from my dad and I just like emulated that behavior. And it was a way for me to get out of what was going on with me and like sort of numb myself and try to like be a different person or at least not feel any feelings anymore. That's kind of what I wanted. So drinking allowed me to do that. So it's all interconnected for me. That idea of sort of self-medication, making decisions as a 14 year old as, you know, finding yourself in essentially a very adult environment and then thinking, right, what's my way out? It's probably not surprising that you turn to what you had seen other people potentially turn to the, the alcohol you saw that as the as, as as a way forward sure well I mean yeah that's what my dad did I mean I'm sort of taught this right because when you when you grow up in this kind of environment my dad drank and then the family we just lied and made excuses for him so that's the behavior that I learned it was like okay you go and you do the thing and then you just lie and you pretend like everything's fine and so I just did that for like a decade 
14 sort of through to 24 uh, is a sort of a, a time in your life whereby you sort of go through sort of various things as like a teenager, and then a, a young adult Th- through your alcoholism. W- w- were this, did you still hit those sort of checkpoints, if you like, in terms of like uh, educationally, sort of socially, or, or do you feel like that there were maybe sort of opportunities missed during that time? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think it kind of obviously set me up for failure in a lot of ways. I mean, I did graduate high school. Um, like I did manage to do that because that was really important to my mom. I wanted to graduate high school before like she passed away. Um, and I was able to do that. And she saw me walk across the stage and do the whole thing. Um, but in that sort of environment that I was in, I got myself into an abusive relationship with an older guy and I was stuck in that relationship. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word stunted because it's not a very nice word, but <laughs> but it did sort of like, you know, stunt my like emotional growth. I never processed the loss of my mother. I didn't understand how to communicate my feelings. I didn't even understand how to identify my feelings. So all of a sudden I found myself at 24 years old with like no communication skills whatsoever and no idea who I was. <laughs> You, you, you've already said something quite amazing on on the podcast there was that which that your your anniversary is the first of January when people yeah. talk about New Year's resolutions and trying to make a decision for a new year just even recently on the podcast we've been talking about how difficult it is to actually do that on on the first of January but you obviously made that decision and and made it stick so how did you build up to that decision and then how easy was that how easy was the 2nd of January and the, the 28th of January and the, the 8th of March after that? This is a loaded question, my guy. Okay, well, I, I tried to get sober for like a year. I was in and out of 12-step programs for, for a long time. I would get, you know, a week and then drink. I would get, I, the one time I got 90 days and I went to a meeting and I got my 90-day chip and then I texted my friend and we went out and got drunk to celebrate. This is the behavior. And the reason that I was, I mean, I don't know, it was like, I, I was able to maintain the sobriety like one day at a time for six years. Honestly, it's, it is like one day at a time, <laughs> but uh, my last, my last drink as, as we call it uh, was horrendous. I went like to a new year's Eve party that I wasn't invited to and like crashed it. And I don't remember leaving. And I woke up at a, in a friend's house and I didn't have any of my stuff and I didn't know how I got there. And, uh, I just like sat there on the front porch with my friend smoking a Marlboro light (laughs) as you do (laughs) in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina. And I was like, I have got to do something about this. Like, I just hate this feeling, the, the shame that I carried with me all the time. I was so sick of it. Then I was flying to Newcastle to live here for six months uh, on like the 18th of January of that year. And I just had this feeling that if I couldn't get it together now, then I might as well just like kiss the rest of my life goodbye. Like what would be the point? Um, And so, yeah, I just kind of threw myself into things. And yeah, it was really hard, especially being in like a foreign country, trying to get sober and not knowing anyone. I knew like one singular person in the whole of the country. And, but I think uh, that gave me sort of like the gift of desperation, uh, which was like, I had to go to meetings. Uh, I again, use like 12 step recovery. I had to meet people and I had to get involved or else like I wasn't going to make any friends I wasn't going to know anybody um and I was most absolutely going to relapse and then eventually like it you know my addiction would take my life and I didn't want that to happen did the fact that you were sort of moving to a new country and sort of all the things that all sort of the I guess the lifestyle changes that come with that did that allow you to sort of reset your own mind as to saying I now live in the UK I don't drink but the rest is essentially an open but you could you could you could arrive in the UK, I guess, and meet people and tell them you don't drink because you, you, you're new and the people could go, all right, this is CC. We, will, we won't offer her a drink. Did that, that sort of break, did that, was that an opportunity or was that a bit of a curse? I, I mean, I, I suppose it would have in that way if I would have been able to like communicate that effectively, you know, because it's like, <laughs> because it's like, oh, I don't drink. Oh, why? Mm. Well, do you have a problem? Like, are you sick or are you like, whatever, do you mind if I drink, you know, then it becomes this like whole thing, which, you know, I like to make fun of (laughs) people. It's like, you know, I don't know if you've seen online, but it's like people like equate it to mayonnaise or something. It's like, you don't like mayonnaise. Why don't you like mayonnaise? Do you mind if I have mayonnaise? Like, it's very, very silly, but it's sort of like, 
I didn't know how to articulate that. I didn't know, like, was I just going to say, like, I'm an alcoholic. Now I say that because I really enjoy making people uncomfortable and I got to get my kicks where I can. And I do. <laughs> but in those very beginning stages, like, I don't know. And actually, alcohol was a lot easier to get here because it's in like every corner shop. Whereas back in the States, you had to go to like a special like government run store to get liquor, which is obviously what I drink, the art stuff. Cause you know, you, of course, <laughs> you've, you've, but you've arrived in a country. I mean, Newcastle itself is, is, is sort of sometimes known a little bit as a, as a party town, but I think there's very much a culture in the UK that like it's wine o'clock and mm. it's sort of like the kids have gone to bed, glass of wine sort of culture. Oh, that's almost, I would say, is probably almost like the aspirational lifestyle for adults yeah. in the UK. The normalization of alcohol is absolutely, you know, everywhere. And, you know, you, you tell anyone who's ever gone to like a barbecue, a wedding, a funeral, and you say, not for me, I'm not drinking. For whatever reason, it might be you might be working, you might be driving, you might be an alcoholic, you might be doing it because you're on antibiotics. You are always met with this, what, like, what? They're not mm -hmm. drinking. And, and part of me thinks that it's just because it's so normal that people think, well, why aren't you doing what everyone else is doing? But I think the other thing is that sometimes people realize that they probably also maybe shouldn't drink as much as they do. So when they, when they find someone who's actually knocked it on the head completely, there's almost like, oh, I should be suspicious of this person mm -hmm. because they've probably done the thing I think I should probably do. And I'll try and make them feel bad because then it'll make me feel better about how I feel about myself. Mm. Yeah, I think I've definitely found that to be true. Even within my own family, you know, sometimes you just like serve as a mirror that nobody wants to look at. When you, when you, when people look in the mirror, do you, do you get a sense there's judgment on the things that you've experienced or when the, 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 the sort of stigma that comes from the phrase alcoholic or alcoholism, do you, do you see that in people? Do you recognize the, those telltale signs that, that, that their brain is processing maybe something about you? Sure. Sometimes, but a lot of times it's fun to watch sort of like the cognitive dissonance happen. It's like, wait, I thought that alcoholics were only like, like dirty old men under bridges drinking like liquor out of a, out of a, you know, container, like a, you know what I mean? Like out of a bag and, and you're like, and I'm standing there at like a business networking event. <laughs> like I'm an, I'm an addict, you know, it's like, what are these two things? And that's why I like to be so like upfront about it. And I'm just like, you know, this is who I am because there is such a stigma around it. And yeah, I suppose sometimes I do get the judgment and things, but most of the time people are like, that's kind of cool. Like, tell me more about it. Or they'll start to ask me questions like, how do you know you're an alcoholic? What made you stop? Like, how do you, can you tell? And I'm like, if you're asking me that question, you already know the answer. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, it, in terms of when, when, when you hit sort of sobriety and that, that sort of day by day process that you talked about, can I shoot like when you talked about the things like the, the abusive relationships that you found yourselves in, of course, the, the grief that you were dealing with as well. Was there a point where you thought, right now I need to process some of those actions? I need to process some of the traumas that I've experienced. Is there a day where you suddenly go, no, maybe, maybe today's the day or is that a process that you can begin and explore over a period of time as well as dealing with that sort of day-to-day -day functionality? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's important like when you're making any big changes like that to create some sort of like foundation for yourself where you can like, let me take care of my basic needs. You know, a lot of times you're like, you're like jonesing or whatever, you're still having like cravings for alcohol, you know, that kind of thing. So it was like, try to sort of get that under control and then like, okay, let's do a little bit more of the internal work. And it has definitely been like a, a process. I mean, through 12 step recovery, you do literally the 12 steps. And part of that is uh, step four is a searching and fearless moral inventory where you turn your entire life and everything bad that's ever happened to you or that bad that you've done to other people into a literal spreadsheet and then share it all with another human. That's terrifying. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely a process. And, and in terms of that, did you, the, the learning process of sort of reopening that book or putting it down into an Excel spreadsheet, did you, was it, was it difficult sort of straight away to do it or did you 
see the benefit benefits of it quite quickly because I, I sometimes get a sense where people are dealing with things that have happened in the past they almost don't want to they don't want to peek into the book for fear of what's to come but then yeah. how, how much do you open the book i'm sort of doing this with my hands here uh, <laughs> yeah. how, how much do you open the book before you suddenly go okay yeah i can i can look at this with one eye right let's let's start to read it a little bit this is the thing i think it depends on how you do it um and i think the the way i did it is not necessarily how i would encourage other people to do it not to diminish 12 step recovery in, in any way but uh, the way i did it was like was very very intense um and i didn't necessarily like give myself the time or maybe the support that I needed or even know that I would need it that much. I didn't understand like quite how re-traumatizing it would be. And obviously this depends on kind of like where you are and your own stuff and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, to, to lay everything out in your, in your life like that in some sort of like quantifiable thing where you could like <laughs> give everything a score and then add it up at the end. Uh, you know, it's maybe not, maybe you don't need to do that. I think we can look at, at things that have happened to us, but we don't need to necessarily rehash the details of the event itself. That's not the point. The point is like the feelings around it and what that brings up. Do you have any sort of like guilt or shame attached to that? Why? Is that actually yours? Like, did you actually play a part in that? Are you taking ownership for somebody else's stuff? Because I find a lot of the time that's what it is. And if you can kind of look at it in that way, um, sort of objectively take yourself out and look at it as a third party, more about the feelings around it rather than the experience itself, you find it a lot less traumatic. I, I think just as human beings, I think we have a complete inability just by sort of natural processes to see a bigger picture in terms of our own journey. Cause I think you often think, well, everything that's happened to me for good or bad is the consequences of the things that I've done or the conversations that I've had or the places that I've been or the people I've been with. And you almost accept that you're, you have ownership over that story and those set of circumstances. But of course, if it was like a friend or a family member or a loved one, and they were telling you about things that you'd done or you'd see, you'd see you'd, the advice that you would give to them or the things that you would say would be completely different as well. And I wonder whether or not, and I, I'm not advocating that we have this sort of like self-reflective time, but I think as part of the, the way we deal with our own lives, that's got to be built in, hasn't it? To, to sort of look at, right, well, that happened to me. How did I cope with it? What were the circumstances around that? How was I feeling at the time? And why was I making those decisions? I think if we give ourselves that time for sort of reflection, it allows us just to see a little bit more perspective. And I think it would then allow us to then, when we make steps forward in the future, make more educated steps, if you like, to, to give it a, well, I, I'm making these decisions based on the whole of my experience, not just the thing that happened the day before, the day before, the day before that. And I think that would, just in, in everyday life, that could be huge, I think, for a lot of people. If we take the time to sort of comprehend that, you know, we don't have to go through the full maybe Excel spreadsheet, but, <laughs> but no, Excel's not great to work with. Let's, let's, try, <laughs> let's try Google Sheets. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but that thing of, of, of just going, right, well, why did that happen? How did I respond? Why did I respond that way? Would be, that's, that's huge, isn't it? And, yeah, and absolutely. Because suddenly you realize like, this was my responsibility. This wasn't my responsibility. I did this because that because, you know, beliefs are just like reinforced memories, so just reinforced experiences. And, and so we create these belief systems about our lives based on the things that we've experienced. Well, it maybe you have these like false belief systems because you think that you've like done all these things, but actually like maybe it wasn't your fault or you're beating yourself up for something like carrying something around that's not yours. And if you just look at it, then you could put it down <laughs> and you know, it could like change everything just like that little bit of perspective. I mean, I gave myself such a hard time for so long about, you know, being in active addiction and the way I behaved when my mom was dying. And you know what I mean? Like I was a teenager and I was doing my best and like did I take responsibility for the things that I did and apologize where I need to apologize sure but I'm not carrying that around with me anymore like I acknowledge that I did the best that I could in a really messed up situation and I and I've put that down I'm not like carrying around that shame anymore I don't have anything to be ashamed of 
And of course, from a, from a society point of view, and I, I don't know if this was the case with you, there will be people who from the outside are making all of those judgments as that process is going on and going, well, she's messing this up because, or why is she acting like this? Or why does he do this? Or he's ruining everything, or she's not responding the way that I think that she should respond from this outside perspective as well. And I think maybe the empathy that we could show to someone during those stages would at least make those stages a little bit more straightforward or less judgmental. So there was less sort of hangover from that period of time, for want of a better phrase, that would then allow you. So there you could let me deal with my stuff as well as let me then also try to repair a reputation that I feel like I've destroyed from people who don't really know me, that I probably don't owe anything to. But, but that's that's sort of how society works, doesn't it? Yeah, but even people who do know you, I mean, it's a lot of times, obviously, it's the people who are closest to us who like, who we hurt each other the most. And there was a lot of that, you know, as a kid, it was like, how dare you be having all of these issues while your mom is dying? Like, we have enough to worry about. And so does she like, how dare you have problems? <laughs> you know, there was a lot of that, like internally happening. And I did like, hang on to that and keep that and like, well, well, why am I doing those things? And, and why am I behaving this way? But actually like I would never that was the worst time in my life certainly yeah it was the worst time in my life when my mom was dying. I had to sort of think it was it yes it was <laughs> uh obviously it was and I would never judge anybody else based on the way they behaved in the absolute worst time of their lives why would you <laughs> why, why would you do that and obviously looking back on that now I've been able to learn that lesson but I think sometimes when we don't experience things for ourselves or a lot of people still don't understand addiction or or even like you know like mental health diagnoses and things like that why people behave the way they do we just have our idea of the way that people should behave and how dare they not do that and if we don't see it for ourselves or experience it for ourselves we tend to maybe not have that perspective when they're in the worst circumstances, that is potentially the point where they need the most support. That's when they need the most empathy. That That's when they need the arm around them that helps them back on that path. Then you can judge them. You know, Let's judge people instead when they're on the even playing field, when they've got the opportunities in front of them and when they're doing it for a, for a, for a positive reason, rather than this sort of judgment that comes from going, well, when this was going on, you weren't really, or when that was going on. Of course they weren't because they were experiencing the same, you know, trauma that you were or, or they were having it worse at the time. Or, you know, God forbid, you don't have a clue what they were going through. You're just making a judgment based on something you're viewing from the outside, which actually means absolutely nothing. But it's just really unhelpful. But it might make you feel better about yourself. And we kind of do that as well, don't we, as human beings? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need people around us who will like, who will see us for who we are and call us on our stuff, but also people who will like, you know, support us and be like what you were saying earlier about the way that we think about ourselves and talk to ourselves is, is not how we would talk to our best friend. We need to have those people around us who will be like, hey, you're having a really hard time right now that's okay. Like, Hey, you kind of are struggling and you made maybe not the best decision. I still love you. Like just until we can get through it, you know, just somebody to sort of like hold our hand and, and like walk across whatever that, you know, that bridge is with us until we get to the other side. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we've got CC Reagan with us uh, on the program today. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, right to heal, right to heal.me, by the way, is the website where people can go and find out more information uh, about the work you're doing at the moment. Um, writing, um, poetry, I think you do a bit of haiku that's thrown into the mix as well. When, when did you, in terms of that journey that we've talked about there, at what point did you start writing things down and then thinking, actually, this, this, this feels like it's good. This is, this is putting me in a, in a good place. You know, always actually, um, I feel like I've, I've always written, um, my, my dad wrote like bits and, uh, I, you know, I still have, like, I have an Anne of Green Gables journal from when I was like 11, 12 years old. <laughs> I've always sort of like journaled and written things down. Um, I just like being creative in, in that way. And it's sort of always been, you know, even if there was like nobody to talk to or, or nobody to listen, or I didn't necessarily know how to even communicate what I was feeling I could always sort of like write things down and explore and there was no judgment in that because it was just me and my pen and my journal and that was it <laughs> and if I wanted to rip it out and burn it after and nobody ever see it then I could absolutely do that um and if I wanted like a friend to read it then I could do that too um 
uh, yeah, so it's always been something that I've done and done like, you know, little poetry readings and things like that as I've gotten older, you know, like creative writing classes and the literary magazine in high school and all that stuff. Like I've just always loved it. Um, and then in recovery from addiction, it's been like, instrumental in my healing. I mean, I credit writing with saving my life like on multiple occasions. So um, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's sort of transformed with me as I've needed it to, I suppose. I mean, that, that's, that's huge, isn't it? And, and, and what a great thing that you were able to sort of have that in your life or to have that avenue to explore. And in terms of the sort of community that you're, you, you've built around this as well, um, the, the testimonies and online are, are really strong in terms of like, how people have sort of interacted with you and the difference it's made to them. What are those sort of things that you say to people that, that, that allows them to sort of open up on a, on a piece of paper or with a pen or on a, a tablet or how, however they, they choose to write? What are those things that, 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 that allow you not just to put things down, but to sort of improve that, that mindset and to sort of get those thoughts ticking over in a way which allow them to sort of reset themselves and uh, what's the phrase you used to have for Windows computers? Defragment. Ah, yeah. Um, I mean, I just, I think honestly, for a lot of people, it's just knowing that they're not on their own. You know, suddenly they they join the community and, and, and it's all different people. I mean, I serve survivors of addiction, abuse and trauma and trauma, you know, really sort of runs the gamut of things. So there's all sorts of people in there. They're like recovering addicts like me. Um, and then people who have been through like abusive relationships like me or, or other things. And, but the, we're all here for the same reason, you know what I mean? That we're all there to like find healing and, and explore like who we are and like, you know, give ourselves the, the space, so to speak, to figure out who we are. I'm doing air quotes. Everybody says space. Uh, so it's a little bit like I need new words now because I'm annoyed that everybody's overusing all the words. But anyways, <laughs> I'm a writer. I'll, I'll find it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think that's a lot of it, honestly, is just knowing that like you're not alone in your experiences, because when we're going through things and then we feel like we're the only one who's going through that stuff, it can be really easy to like judge ourselves and feel super isolated. So first of all, it's just like knowing there are other people who accept us uh, for exactly who we are. And then also kind of goes back to what I said earlier about like asking questions and giving yourself the the room not just to like okay I'm gonna write about this and whatever and just rehash our trauma but like you know write a letter to yourself like how you actually talk to yourself and then let's like deep dive into like maybe why you feel that way and then at the end maybe write another letter and it might sound a little bit different and you know, just kind of reframing experiences and do a lot of things like, what are you struggling with right now? It's like hanging out in your brain <laughs> that you can't really get rid of. And I don't do like the toxic positivity thing. I, I hate that. If you feel a feeling, then you feel it for a reason and you should explore it. But there's always another side. We can give ourselves the gift of perspective, you know, and a lot of times that could be writing things down objectively, but it could also be like, okay, uh, I'm going through this at the moment. What is it teaching me? And what is the other side of that? So like, I haven't spoken to my father in six years. On the other side of that is I surround myself with people who love, uplift, and support me. So this sort of thing. And just giving people like the room to do that and just to be honest, I think that's really all it takes. It's it's not that complicated. <laughs> I wish it was, uh, but it's not. <laughs> you could charge a lot more if it was more exactly. complicated. Exactly. <laughs> And in terms of that, I guess as well, I, I wanted to ask you in terms of the, the sorts of things that people want to explore, have, have, you been, have you been surprised by the types of things that people have found either triggering in terms of, you know, uh, memory, memories that they have from the past, things that, they, things that they feel like they need to deal with? As you can say, there's a whole range of different people, but then there must be times where people start going down an avenue thinking, all right, I, I never thought of that perspective before, or maybe I, I'll think of a different strategy for, for this because, you know, their experiences may be a little bit different. Uh, well, I'm fortunate enough to have collected lots of different experiences over the course of my life. So there's not very many things that people can say to me that surprise me, but when I started the community, it was just based on like writing and journaling and poetry. And that's what I teach. I think what surprised me the most is the different like vehicles and things that people are interested in. It's become, um, I mean, it's called Right to Heal. It's called the Right to Heal community. And we do a lot of writing and that's what I teach. But 
I have so many other people in there to talk about so many other things. You know, people want to learn about crystal healing. They want to learn about Reiki. We do like uh, drum sessions. We had, uh, like an EFT practitioner, uh, you know, we have so many different things and so many different people come in because people come into this, this space, they know that it's safe and they can explore. And they're like, I want to learn about this weird stuff that's going on. Bring somebody in and talk about that. You know, um, I, I get, suppose, uh, more people are interested in like the body positivity side of things than I had originally thought. Maybe that's surprised me a little bit as far as like what people want to explore a bit more. We do a lot of stuff about like self-love and things like that. And I do a lot of like body positive stuff on like my Instagram and things that people really like. So um, I am like diving into that a little bit more. Excellent. And that just goes to show as well that I think as, as we sort of find these techniques of dealing with some of these issues to actually um, uh, allow people that space to kind of go, well, there's this and there's this, but also there's there's this side of my life that I've never even looked at as well. You've almost you're you're almost equipping them, aren't you, with a skill set that goes, okay, you've never thought about this or dealt with this, but maybe through this technique, it's something that you can take a look at. And I guess for a lot of people, that's huge because if people then build that into their processes, then yeah. those potentially those those issues that will come in the future, they go, well, I've all, I've already got you know my my weaponry ready. I've got an arsenal that's lined up, ready, full of techniques that yeah. will allow me to process. Yeah, that. I love me calling it an arsenal. I mean, I call it like a wellness toolbox, but I think I'm going to change it to like wellness <laughs> arsenal or something. <laughs> I, think, I think that I, and I use that phrase because I almost think that like you almost need the toolbox is the right phrase as well okay i'm dealing with this now what do i need to, so i do i do this now if i feel terrible if i feel for some if i just feel terrible i have this sort of my arsenal is right did i stay up too late last night i have uh have the kid did the kids sleep through the night um did i drink too much the night before have i eaten well recently have i been out for a run recently have i done a bit of gardening recently when was the last time you played the ukulele i almost i have like a checklist in my head which basically just looks at all of those things which in and of themselves any one of them is not necessarily a problem but if two or three of them start to add up you start to go that maybe that's and what i can then do i go oh yeah it's fine because the, i've ticked three boxes there and I can, and then as long as I then do a couple of those things, it then allows me, my brain then accepts that as, as you've got a solution. Like yeah. it's okay. You figured out the problem and you also know what the solution is. So we don't need to worry about that as much, which I, th I feel like is a, is a good place to be, but I've had to have 233 previous conversations to this one to sort of have enough understanding of what what that would be and how that would look and, and where that might possibly take me as opposed to sitting in a classroom with 11 well eight eight nine ten eleven year olds and going these are the things you might have to deal with when these things come your way here are some things you could try mm -hmm. i feel like we need to go to that place that those sorts of things that we've talked about there you know that that cc comes into a school and you know talks through you know what a poem could mean or how you might write words down in a way which is beneficial to you and then for the people around you as well. I think that's a really, really important thing. And I think as well, it would, it would, it would save a lot of stress for a lot of people as well as all of those other things around, uh, you know, NHS time and, and uh, you know, yeah. government money that would need to be spent. If we just invested in these sorts of techniques, the sort of things you're talking about, that, but, but earlier on, particularly yeah. with young people. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had had this stuff. I wish I'd had somewhere to go or some sort of like knowledge. But I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I mean, I'm 30, but it wasn't that long ago that I was in high school and, and self care was not a thing. We didn't talk about that. We weren't talking about like mental health. We weren't like, you know, you go on TikTok now and you can learn all kinds of stuff about like how to organize your life better if you have ADHD. Like there are so many different things and, and so many more like easily accessible resources now, whereas like it wasn't even in the conversation before, but something like, you know, working with young people and, and going into schools and speaking and stuff like that is something that I would really love to do because I agree with you. I think if we can teach people these skills at, at like a, a formative age, then they'll be much more equipped as they sort of like go into future life to be like, oh, I'm feeling this feeling because of this. And I know how to communicate effectively because of this. It's the end. And then it can be done instead of being some sort of like spirally thing that sets them off some weird path. 
I'll point people in uh, the direction of your website again, so you see if that's okay. Uh, right to heal.me. That's right, W R I T E, uh, to heal.me. Um, and there's a word that appears on there. I just wanted to ask you to just to wrap it up there. Metam metamorphosis. I knew I'd say that wrong. <laughs> metamorphosis. Uh, I just wanted to get your sort of uh, your your sort of take or your understanding of that word because I think sometimes people presume, you know, it's the it's the you know the uh, the caterpillar that turns into a a butterfly. Mm. And and people always see that as the almost like the ugly duckling where things were bad then things were beautiful like the next day. But there's that slightly mm. shriveled brown period sort of in between, isn't there, where, where everything goes a little bit dark for a little bit before the butterfly emerges from the, the chrysalis is the word I'm, I'm trying to think of. Yeah, I mean, the caterpillar, like when it goes into pupa stage and like beyond, it literally turns into mush. It is just goo and then it becomes something else. Uh, you know, the the idea of like this phoenix rising from the ashes or, or this like butterfly thing or whatever is is a beautiful metaphor. And I really do love it. And that's why I've used it. But it's the integration of the past, rather than like completely shedding it and becoming becoming something new, you know, we can accept the things that happen to us and, and understand and acknowledge and, and all of those things and, and forgive others and forgive ourselves and make that a part of, of who we actually are. It doesn't need to define us, but the acceptance of that is, is what's so important. And that's what allows us to actually go through the transformation. And it does take more than a day, but it, it is absolutely worth the time and effort. I think it's really worth a great point worth making there. Cause I think that thing of the butterfly is still the, the sort of, it's everything the caterpillar was. It was everything the caterpillar did. It was everything the caterpillar ate. It was every, everywhere the caterpillar decided to sleep. You know, th those were very much the factors that, that then allowed this next thing to happen. And it really sort of, it really sort of adds, doesn't it, to that that wider story that we were talking about about our own journeys, ownership of our own journeys, but also being able to sort of see and contextualize them to then allow us to to look forward or to see. The world from a slightly different place plus it would be great to have massive wings and then just be able to fly i know who doesn't want that right i'll, <laughs> I'll work on that one next for you I'll keep it <laughs> absolutely absolutely in the meantime we'll just get some instagram filters or something like that i think yeah. there's probably already one there uh, Cece, <laughs> thank you so much for your time today i really appreciate it there's so much to your story and i think um so much that people will pick up from from right to heal the what you've done so far, the community that you've you've got online as well. Put all the links on the uh, uh, on the uh, the podcast too, so people can get more involved. And and thank you for sharing your time. Uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your time as well in the in the northeast of of England. I'm sure it's very different to, to North Carolina, but you picked a great spot there. Thank you. Yeah, I do love it here. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258. That's if you're experiencing a personal crisis, uh, you're unable to cope and need support. Uh, shout to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.